And we're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow, and we continue our coverage and discussion of, well, that happened, I guess you would say. Uh, joining us once again, uh, always a pleasure to talk to him, always enlightening to talk to him, is Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf is an economist. He's a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also a visiting professor at the New School University in New York, host of Economic Update, Tuesday evenings on Free Speech TV. His latest book is The Sickness is the System. So first of all, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you, RJ. Glad to be here. Rick Wolf, we've spent a lot of the last year, you and I together, and uh, you know, is in our going down our own paths, talking about the possibility of the uh, unraveling of the current state of affairs, whether you want to call it the, the American Empire, whether whether you want to call it the global capitalist system, wh whether you want to call it. Uh, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the idea that major change could be coming, and I know you've said that you were never one of the people who believed that we were at the doorstep of that kind of change until uh, recent events and uh, recent months and years. And I guess since we, we are still talking about the violence uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, and what that represents, uh, I would start with this. Where would you see that uh, these events fitting into this whole notion that we might be seeing an unraveling of things as they currently are? Well, uh, even though I take no pleasure whatsoever in saying this, it seems to me that this yesterday, those events in Washington, are indeed another marker, another step, another symptom, another piece of evidence uh, about a system that is um, unraveling, is falling apart, um, is unable to count on all of those kinds of unspoken and often unconscious connections among people in a society that make up what we like to call community, a sense of being, you know, in the same boat, uh, in the same struggle, not that there aren't differences amongst us, but that alongside those differences is a meaningful sense of solidarity. And mm -hmm. uh, the spectacle of uh, what I take to be working class people, employees mm -hmm. like me, um, going on uh, up to Washington, uh, deeply convinced that an election outcome is different from what the evidence seems to point to, that um, QAnon and other wild conspiracies are in fact directing events, that their own personal difficulties, particularly the economic ones, uh, poor wages, insecure jobs, questionable pensions, uh, all of that are driving people to be um, very upset, very angry, very bitter. And in those moments, uh, they become easy prey for po politicians with right wing uh, agendas who didn't much care for democracy all along anyway, who uh, believe in hierarchical societies, whether the government is the top dog in such a hierarchy or religion or whatever, whatever you have, the military, um, and they rise to the fore. Uh, the, they've done that in Brazil with Bolsonaro. They've done that in England with the conservatives and Brexit, and they've done it here with uh, Trump and the uh, the, the enablers, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, and the others. Um, and for me, it's a replay of things I have seen uh, in the history of the United States in the past, of other countries in the past. I take it very seriously. But yes, it is 
is another step, and I would be glad to tell you what the other steps are, but this is the uh, umpteenth step in a long list. Now, you said something on social media before this happened, I think the day before, that I felt yesterday, I totally agree with, and I felt um, yesterday's events uh, reinforced, and I, it probably disturbed some people to, to hear this, particularly some uh, people on the Democratic side, but you, you wrote this, you wrote, when a society de deprives its citizens of freedom from joblessness, inadequate income, concern about basic health care, education, etc., they may rebel against social rules about masks, social distancing, etc., and you concluded justified anger slash rebellion doesn't always choose the right target. In my mind, anyway, uh, all of that, and particularly that last sentence in a way applies to what happened at the Capitol in that people are, again, my view, uh, people are right to be angry. People are right to feel their government is not responsive to their needs. People are uh, right to feel that uh, the media is not uh, revealing the truth about themselves and their lives and what's happening to them, at least not fully. And uh, now it, it, it may have manifested itself in a terrible and violent way, but it seems to me that when the so-called left in this country does not respond to these terrible truths uh, by confronting them and explaining them, that leaves people all the more easily manipulated by the Donald Trumps and Ted Cruz's and Josh Hawley's of the world. But what, what, do, you, what do you think? Yes, I am not only in agreement, but it seems to me that if we want to engage the blame game, then the Democrats for sure uh, carry their burden of, of blame they allowed, for example, and there are many examples, but they allowed uh, the eight years of Obama before uh, Trump arrives to be years in which the inequality of wealth and income in the United States became markedly worse. The uh, wealth gap between white and black became markedly worse. The prospects for job security became markedly worse. I mean, I could go on, right. but those were the conditions that Mr. Trump and the others were then able to deflect. Let me say a word about this, this wrong target. And I worked hard on that particular phrase to get clear, I hope, what was in my mind. And the example I'm gonna use is actually from another country, but I think it's perfectly parallel. It's the United Kingdom. Their suffering in the crash of 2008 was worse for the working class in Great Britain than it was here in the United States. It wasn't good here either, but it was worse in Great Britain. The standard of living, the average real wage, all of these things went down sharply in the years after 2008 and nine. The result was a level of upset and anger and bitterness, as you put it rightly, RJ, perfectly justified given what they were suffering. But the right wing there, the conservative government, uh, in those days of a, a man named David Cameron, thought up the clever idea of getting the anger deflected away from the economic system that was the cause of their suffering, away away from the behavior of the employers, which were the people who were cutting their wages, cutting their hours, undoing their benefits, and so on, deflecting it onto, yep, the tired old scapegoat, foreigners. And in the case of mm -hmm. Britain, it was Europe. And so he concocted this referendum and hoped that it would get people all excited, but that a reasonable brain would kind of prevail. Well, he misjudged, just the way I believe uh, Americans in power have misjudged our people he here. And to the surprise of the conservatives, an angry working class bought the idea and voted Brexit. 
to leave Europe. Okay, the last five years since that vote have continued the growing inequality, the growing decline of real wages, the growing loss of benefits. England is in worse shape today even than it was back then. This Brexit has solved nothing. The debates over it made the situation worse. And the agreement signed at the end of last year that they're now beginning to enter into is going to make the situation worse again. But here in the United States, we did the same thing. Instead of demonizing Europe, we deflected the anger of the American people first on immigrants, the poor families coming from Central America uh, to make a new life in the United States, just like the ancestors of most uh, American citizens today did, or most of them. Uh, and when that was done, when we had exhausted with the wall in Mexico border and, and all the rest, then it became China's turn, another convenient foreigner to get people excited about so they wouldn't deal with their problem. And just like in England, what was the result? Did the condition of American workers get better? Not a bit. Did the manufacturing jobs come back that were good jobs? Not a bit. Did the gap between rich and poor become less? Quite the contrary. And as if the point had to be driven home even more, the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, has a disastrous failure both to prepare for this viral pandemic, then to contain it, and now to vaccinate against it. I mean, these are signs of a society that is hell-bent on going forward in the capitalist way, ever greater wealth for those already wealthy, ever greater difficulties for the mass of people. And then what? We're supposed to be shocked that right-wingers can galvanize this and focus people on storming a capital which changes nothing in the basic problems they have, a kind of, uh, if I could borrow a metaphor, tilting against uh, will, uh, windmills, a la Don Quixote, you know? It, it, it's sad to watch. The violence is horrible, obviously, but the sadness is the pointlessness of it all. It doesn't solve anything. And, uh, you know, and again, we're talking with the economist Richard Wolf. It, it, it's interesting that you bring up Brexit uh, in this context, because I, 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 to me, and I don't know to what extent this is a subliminal process with working people in Great Britain and the U.S., to what extent is a kind of cognitive, cognitive dissonance or, or whatever. But I think when people are aware at whatever levels that they lack power, they lack collective autonomy over their own lives, then Brexit in a way, it makes complete sense on what level? Because if they're not being offered from a, you know, the then milquetoast and now again milquetoast Labour Party in the UK or whomever, uh, a real alternative, uh, they're going to go to, you know, this pre-Corbyn, uh, they're going to go to, well, the way I would view Brexit, I guess, from their eyes is we get some control over our lives back. And the way I would view this kind of hostile attitude toward and what happened on Capitol Hill was, uh, you know, of course, there's some people who are just unleashing their inner demons or violence or whatever, but uh, what is, well, we don't have any power, so let's just go take some. And I think we're not speaking, and I love your right. thoughts on this, but I feel that we're not speaking to the notion, my point being, you know, my sense is that whether in Great Britain or, or on Capitol Hill, uh, that the sometimes extreme reaction to powerlessness uh, manifests itself in the kind of taking back of power or the perceived taking back of power because it's not actually going to work for them. But what do you think about this notion of collective power and powerlessness as being kind of motivator for this sort of chaos? Yes, I think that it's absolutely correct. For me, uh, the power issue is very intimately intertwined with the economic issue. You can console yourself if the power you have is very minimal, politically speaking, if you feel very far away 
from the quote-unquote representatives whether it be in the city hall of the town you live in or the state or the federal level. But if you have a compensating control in some sense over your own life, you have a job that is reasonably secure. You have an income that allows you uh, to do things that are important in your life, in the life of your family and so on. Then in a sense, you have that, let's put it local power over your household that compensates you, at least to an extent, for the loss of real political power. But if you don't have the political power and then the economy erodes the security of your job, the adequacy of your income and all the rest, then it becomes unbearable that you don't have neither the political power nor the household power. The boundary between them fuzzes away, and you become the angry, bitter uh, person that that was on display uh, yesterday, and that was on display in the months leading up to Brexit and in the fights in, in the UK still going on between the, what they call the, the leavers and the remainers, the two sides of that struggle, which is far from resolved in Britain. And, and here's the biggest part of it, RJ which is I don't see any signs that the new incoming administration of Joe Biden and especially the economic team that he has assembled, some of whom I know personally, this is a group of people that there's nothing wrong with them personally, and I'm not commenting on that. But in terms of what they've done all their lives, what they've written, uh, uh, their, their whole formation, Janet Yellen and I were classmates at Yale getting our PhDs together uh, at the same time. I know exactly what her curriculum was. I had the same teachers she did, etc. These are people who have never understood the depths of the divisions in the United States economy, what it means to have these levels of inequality, how they percolate through the system, and how they arise from the very organization of our enterprises, the constant arrangement of hierarchy in which a tiny minority, the owner of the business, uh, the major shareholders, the board of directors, make all the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. And of course, they give the bulk of them to themselves. And if you don't change that situation, the inequality that is so central to all of these issues is simply going to continue to get worse. I mean, look at the out of control of this. We've been fighting a pandemic that threatens us all for 10 months. And during that time, the richest people in the country became markedly richer, while 20 odd million Americans have been reduced to collecting inadequate unemployment. Employment compensation. I mean, this is a, an economy spinning out of control. And yes, they were at, angry at Mr. Trump. But if I were Mr. Biden, I'd be quaking in my shoes because this anger is rooted in, in conditions that are deteriorating. And there is no reason to expect other than a larger group of angry people will be redirecting their own upset, not at a Trump, but at whoever comes after Trump, if they don't show the kind of willingness and commitment to face the basic changes that have to be made. And I'm afraid I don't see any of that. You know, you made a point about uh, the, the, the lame Labor Party, indeed in England, but they had someone who was trying to make big changes, Jeremy Corbyn, and the old right. establishment got rid of him, just like you had someone like Bernie Sanders willing at least to begin to move in that direction, and the establishment got rid of him here. I think both establishments are going to look back on those behaviors and regret what they did. You know, that's very interesting, Richard Wolf, and, and I was thinking again as we were talking about this this concept I brought up earlier of cognitive dissonance, of the idea that 
you're being told uh, things are one way, especially, you know, it's used for children. Um, you're being told you know, your parent loves you, for example, but all the evidence you experience says they do not, that kind of thing. Uh, right. It feels to me as if uh, my, my big fear for the coming year is that we're going to have a government that uh, foists economic cognitive dissonance once again on the population as the Hillary Clinton campaign did, as the Obama administration did, of telling people and with the uh, collaboration of your colleagues, a couple of whom I know as well, very nice people, but uh, in the administration who will say, look, the numbers are improving. The numbers are getting better. The, uh, you know, your lives may feel awful, but uh, trust us, uh, the stock market is booming. Uh, the top line unemployment rate is reducing and uh, maybe even the polls, because I think this affects uh, polling. Maybe people even say, yes, I think the economy is improving, but inside they're terrified, they're anxious, they can't get the health care they need, they don't know if they'll be able to pay their basic bills or if they'll have a job next month. Um, and I'm afraid that if we don't start with an economic story, that say, and won't come from the government, so it has to come from us, I guess, that says this is what's happening to you and this is what we need to do. Uh, I'm afraid that, well, I, I don't want to say I'm afraid. I believe that's where we should change. And maybe we can conclude if you, you know, whatever your thoughts are on that. Yes, I'm afraid that we've run out of time or rather they've run out of time. The, these happy uh, rose colored glasses that things are getting better and now that we have a Democrat, this and that will happen. We don't have the kind of Democrats that do the kinds of things we need. We have the wrong kind. Let me remind everyone a little bit as a closer about our history. In the 1929 crash that became a horrific 25% unemployment by the year 1933, we had elected in 32 a middle of the road lame Franklin Roosevelt, a guy who, who thought a balanced budget was what he ought to give to the American working class that was in horrible condition uh, because of the crash, the kind of condition described in John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath uh, or of Mice and Men, for those of you who know that literature. Okay, what changed him was a massive movement from below, the labor organizing around the CIO, the two socialist parties that got tens of thousands of members, the communist party likewise, these organizations worked together to produce a groundswell from below. That's what changed the government. That's what made suddenly Mr. Roosevelt become a new dealer wasn't his idea, it was forced on him for his own political survival in terms of career. This kind of situation we don't have today. We don't have the militant left mobilization. It might have been enabled had we given the support to Occupy Wall Street that it asked for uh, in the autumn of 2011. It might have developed around the candidacies of Bernie Sanders and then AOC in 2016, 2018, and now 2020. But that wasn't forthcoming. Nor was the establishment of the Democratic Party some mere watcher of all of this. What destroyed Occupy Wall Street was the government of Mr. Obama, which used garbage trucks to mow those tents down in the uh, central towns and cities. Every obstacle has been thrown in the way of a building of the kind of coalition, even though the president would often defend his lack of action by saying there isn't a groundswell that I need behind me. Yeah, you yourself blocked that groundswell, Mr. Obama and the people around him, if, of course, it's not just him. There has to be a different kind of politics a different kind of social movement if you're going to get an adequate response. Otherwise, I think we're all going to be in the position of watching one of those slow motion 
uh, movies on television where they lower the speed and you're in this horrified moment as the camera slows down, but you know that the train is on a track headed towards a stone wall and you want to just shout into your TV screen to all the people to jump off before it hits the wall. What we saw in Washington, D.C. yesterday is going to happen again, only next time a lot of the people are not going to be feeling friendly to the guy in the White House. That was bad enough, as you could see. Imagine if we have repetitions at the State House, at the City Hall, on the streets of our country of people who have no solution to a problem that keeps getting worse and they're not going to go quietly because Americans don't want to do that. I think we're in very, very tough shape. And it is not helping us that we need, to, that we have political leaders who seem to be specialists in denial, in looking at some happy statistic. You know, the economy, and I say this as a professional economist, the economy always shows us some good statistics and some bad ones. That's always true. The person who points to the good ones and says, look how everything's wonderful, is a person you shouldn't listen to. Just like a person who only points to the bad ones and says, look at that, is some. You've got to look at them both. Here's the irony. The stock market is going up, but 10% of Americans own 80% of the stocks. A rising stock market is good mostly for them. It isn't for the rest of of us. Meanwhile, we have 20 odd American millions getting unemployment benefits. Everybody knows that's not a good sign. Right? So you got to put these together. And the net result when you add the pandemic and you add all the other signs, a level of indebtedness of our, our business community we've never seen in the history of this country. I think the conclusion is we are in deep trouble, but we lack the political leadership even to admit this, let alone to make a solution. If you've ever gone to an Alcoholic Anonymous meeting, you'll know that one of the rules is when you stand up to speak, you say, I am an alcoholic. And the reason you do that is because it's important to recognize what your problem is because that very recognition is part of, of the cure you can hope to achieve. The exact same thing is true about an economy. And the other thing uh, about an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting is uh, it's uh, always acknowledged that the solution is a collective one, not an individual one, that it takes right. everybody working together. Um, and it's why so, everybody uh, to be you know, help each other and to be there for each other and to be buddies and to be partners and to, to see this as a collective struggle about a, a situation that affects so many. Again, the parallels with our economy are screaming out at us. And uh, it sounds like for the coming year, uh, people like you and me and the millions of others who are our allies and friends I have our work cut out for us, huh? I, I, I do, but I am experiencing, as I, I'm sure you are as well, RJ, that the audience for what I have tried to say in my life has never been as big or as receptive or as enthusiastic or as interested in figuring out what to do about this as it is now. Uh, I've been pinching myself for the last seven years watching this develop, wondering how long it would last. I don't have to pinch myself. It's real. It's very profound. And it will be in the next two years, I think, that you're going to see what has been building for a long time, but what will appear to people to be a sudden surge of economic and social criticism in which people's basic notion will be we can do better than the capitalist system that we have been trapped in and that's the next step for the pro progress we hope to achieve 
Well, I, for one, am looking forward to it. So Richard Wolf, economist, host of Economic Update. His latest book is The Sickness is the System. As always, uh, thank you for your insights. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure, RJ, and my hat's off to you for continuing an important public service. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Askow, and this is The Zero Hour.